uh, lunch meeting. Today is October 28th, 2021. We're most delighted to have a very high caliber speaker here today with us, uh, Mr. Anil Srivatsa. He's a champion for organ donorship, and I will introduce him in a little bit after we play the Star Spangled Banner with our pianist, Audrey Levine. Audrey, go ahead. Thank you very much, Audrey. We appreciate it You're very welcome. much. We see you next week again. Thank you so much. And uh, please okay. uh, stay with us on this Zoom. It is now my pleasure that I welcome everybody to the Zoom meeting today. It is also uh, a real delight that I see one of our longest time members, uh, HK Shah, uh, that he is able to join us today. Um, so thank you, HK. It is beautiful to see you, of course, as well as Wilfred Wilkinson, past Rotary International President and all the other members that were able to join us today. We're still waiting for our president to join. I hope he will join us soon. But uh, in the meantime, I, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce to you Anil Srivatsa, who is a champion for organ donation program. Anil Srivatsa is a rotary and military bred and has found purpose in his life after a 30 year old checkered corporate and entrepreneurial career. He now spends uh, one fourth of his time in a year driving around the world championing the cause of organ donation with a goal of reaching a million people with this mes message of compassion and fighting fear for love. He has traveled across 44 countries by road telling this story to over 127,000 people via over 550 talks and spoken at over 100 Rotary Clubs, urging them to take on organ donation projects. To facilitate this, he has started a monthly crew of 50 plus Rotarians and applied to start a Rotary Action Group for organ donation. Organ donation is a widely known, but very little is known about it. And as a result, this life-saving act of love and kindness does not get its due. He's a world record holder at the World Transplant Games, where he won gold for Team India. It is now my pleasure to pass the word to Anil Srivatsa. Welcome, Anil. It's a pleasure to have you. Hello, Andreas, and thank you, and uh, everybody, and the uh, past president, RI president. It's, it's an honor to be in this room with you, and um, I do have large expectations from you and what you do may save many lives again. Um, I'm not sure, do I start talking now or are you gonna do your club business? But I'll no, follow your protocol. The word is absolutely yours. And then we go into a question and answer session and we take it from there. Oh, great, okay. I hope everyone can hear me, right? I'm actually sitting in my truck. And if at all, I feel the network is being interrupted, I turn off my video so at least you can hear me. Uh, that said, I am happy to be part of the Rotary family, but I'm in a transition. I've quit my current Rotary club that I chartered two years ago. Uh, that would have been my second charter club as a charter president. I'm now in the process of getting together a, a band of a very committed people to uh, organ donation. And um, I'm in the middle of, well, in the process of chartering a cause-based club, which I believe now Rotary International allows and about time. So all of us in this new club are going to only do one project and everything that relates to organ donation. So hopefully I'll be back in the ranks of a Rotarian. Um, 
very soon. Uh, that said, I say charity begins at home. And uh, it's not just me, everybody says that and I keep hearing them and so I started to say it as well. Uh, I would like to suggest a rotary and not by emails or social media posts or whatever it is. I'd like to do it on the ground at the grassroots level, walk the talk and hopefully hold people by their hands and help them through it. Now, polio, of course, is a uh, shining example of a project that if Rotary put their might and uh, spirit behind, we know we can eradicate a pandemic. Speaking of that, uh, we'll find a way to get rid of this one. But there is a new goal that I would hope Rotary and Rotarians would start understanding a lot more and give it the due it, it deserves. The idea of polio was to increase the quality of life and life itself. And organ donation is no different. You don't need a lot of money to save a life with organ donation. We have systems in place. We have three pillars, strong pillars holding it up. The legal pillar, the medical pillar, and of course the social pillar, which is where it all begins and that's where it's falling apart as well. Medicine has come and taken us to a point where it's possible. They're just making it better and better and better. The legal pillar is making it possible for us without having to exploit somebody, hurt somebody. But the social pillar is where the spring well of generosity starts from. The spring well of love begins. And this love I know exists in every human being out of the womb. It's inbuilt in the DNA. But over time, that DNA begins to see resistance, resistance from exposure, from lack of knowledge, from an unanswered question that persists. And we all know that unanswered questions create and foster fear. And fear comes in the way of that love. Organ donation is a direct act of love. I'm gonna jump in with an analogy here so you can make, if I can make my point clearer. If I asked you to walk down a dark alley in New York, any dark alley, you'll think twice from, about doing that or not at all. But if I turned on a floodlight that illuminated every single dark nook and cranny of that, you're more likely to walk that path. And organ donation is no different. We're in that dark alley. What is that, that floodlight? It's information, awareness. A lot of you may have signed up to be an organ donor on your license, but do you know what happens after that? A handful of you will raise your hands. You believe it's magic after that. You believe you've done your human duty and said, okay, I've signed up, I'm a good person. But two or less out of every 10 that actually sign up on their driver's license, don't make it. Because what happens after that is very seldom known. And I'll just give you a sense of what it means. A driver's license is your willing intent, as per laws in America, is your willing intent to inform somebody that that's what you want to do. Because here the laws are geared towards an individual decision and not a family-led one, unlike in India. But a driver's license is only looked at when asked to look at or when forced to look at in an unfortunate incident of a car crash. If you're dying in the hospital or if you die at home, and I'm talking about post-life donations, which all of us can partake in. It won't happen because you haven't done what it takes after you've signed up on your license. What does it take? Simple things. Tell your family that you did it. Somebody should know that it's somewhere there. It's written somewhere. They can refer to an EMT coming up. Your project could be uh, getting all the EMTs in your community that you serve in your jurisdiction as a club. 
do a training program with them and make it part of their protocol to ask anyone that they encounter that has deceased, any family, hey, were they an organ donor? Do you want to check on their license? Just in case the family member forgot. That very act of small decisions will save a life. What does that life cost? It's priceless. What does it cost to make that life happen? Nothing, just awareness, people involved. Okay, so that's just one thing. The other thing that most people are dissuaded from coming into an afterlife decision to donate their organs. Uh, in my experience and insight of talking to 127,000 people like this, face to face in an engaging platform is religious beliefs or misbeliefs or what you call superstitions or what I call excuses in a very dignified manner to say no. And that comes from fear again. The other day I was given a talk to uh, uh, Long Island Rotary Club near New Rochelle. And one of the uh, objections was, you know, I'm Jewish and I won't be buried in the Jewish cemetery if I gave an organ because that's the law of the Jewish community. And all I had to ask him was, what if you were a kidney failure patient, a CKD patient, and the only quality of life that you can get living on uh, with that is to get a new kidney? Because living on dialysis is not a life you can have. It's just staying alive till someone comes up and says, I love you. He said, no, I'll take a kidney. I said, then will your Jewish uh, community allow you to then go to that cemetery because you have an extra organ, it's not normal. He got him thinking. And that's all uh, Rotarians can do is get people thinking because I believe in the power of thought. The moment you give them the right information, the decisions are correct as well. We all see uh, many campaigns, sign up, sign up, sign up. But we're not looking at the things that are creating the blocks. When you go into a heart surgery, Surgery. They're trying to put a stent to unblock so and do as projects. In every community, if every Rotarian goes, we're a million plus. Imagine that. All it takes is that. Even if 20 people come forward or 20% more people come forward, that's 20% more lives saved. I'm making my point. That's all. So my journey around the world is not just to talk to me a word of mouth. You know something now that you didn't earlier know in a conversation in a living room or in a dining room in a party. If it comes up, you'd have the right information to at least share with someone else and not propagate the myths. It's like young teenagers you know, working with relationships and learning about love, sex, and romance with zero information from anyone that's been there, done that. They're learning from their own peers and making grave mistakes because nobody bothers to come out and tell them how it's really done or what to think about it. Organ donation. Now I cannot instill love, but I surely can do my bit and we all can to clear the path for it. To give no excuses for love to say, oh, listen, because fear and courage are brothers and sisters. They're not the opposite of each other. Courage is not that you're not afraid. It's only that you act and do the right thing in spite of your fear. That's courage. Our men and women in uniform, you don't think they're afraid to go out facing the streets or the enemy in front. They're afraid to get the bullet, but they still go out there because it's the right thing to do for the land they want to protect, for the people they want to protect. And that's courage. And that's why we say they're courageous, but they're not fearless. And people are fearing organ donation. All we have to do is give them the tools to be courageous and step up for fellow humanity, or at least their loved ones. There are a million people on dialysis, just to give you an example. They don't have to be if they had the love and uh, affection and sympathy and enough information in their families, because every family has a donor. My brother had one in me. I had the same fears 
And once I went through all of those things, including a potential divorce because my wife didn't give me consent as per Indian law, I must tell you, I'm an American, but I live in India. And my wife didn't give me consent because she was afraid. She didn't know enough. I didn't know enough to tell her. My 14 and 16 year old kids, when I ran away from home trying to get my head straight, I went away into the Himalayas because I didn't know whether to save my marriage or save my brother or both. And my kids intervened and uh, got my wife to understand by asking one simple question, hey ma, if my brother needs this, will you, will you object? If I can save my brother's life, will you object? My wife suddenly got a hallelujah moment and said, hey, yeah, makes sense. And I know my brother, and she knows I'm really close to my brother. My brother's a neurosurgeon, a fellow Rotarian in India. All I asked him to do in return was do one free surgery a month for someone who cannot afford. That's good payoff, <laughs> good pay forward. But if you uh, help, me spread this word. I'm a traveling minstrel. In fact, the fact that I am traveling is because all of you help me. It is not that I do this alone. I'm not a island. I'm a, I'm a child raised by a village, the Rotary Village. Every talk I give, I do something that satisfies two things. I beg, I have my hat out and say, just pay for my gas so I can go to the next one. But that's not the only reason I do it. I do it because it keeps me humble. It lets me shed my ego because it's not easy to put your hand out. It's easier to go ask for millions. It looks like you are somebody. But when I ask for hundreds and a few thousands just so I can put gas in my truck so I can reach the next meeting and talk to the next set of people, it's humbling keeps me grounded, but it also does one thing, that because I know that powers me ahead, I try and set up more and more talks. I cold call as I did your club, because I don't have a big army behind me trying to set me up. It's just me on the road. And that's why I thank you for responding. There's a saying in, Indian, in an Indian language called Hindi, and Mr. Shah, you wouldn't know this. It loosely translates to this. Do good and let it flow in the river, because it will help somebody downstream, but you'll never know it. Will you join me? And there's another saying that says, I left home alone. If you remember Forrest Gump, I'm very loosely called Forrest Gump in my family and my uh, outer circles because as I came, he runs and kept running and walking. I'm just driving. And as I walk alone, people join me behind me and a whole caravan now exists. And you guys are part of that now. So help me get to my next meeting. I am a 501c3 nonprofit now uh, in here and in India as well. But my goal to start the Rotary Action Group is to help clubs that don't have an idea because I know when I go to smaller clubs, they have no clue how to do this. And I found that there was no RAG for organ donation, surprisingly. So I put in an application, finished up all the requirements. I'm waiting on the RI board to take it up and hopefully give me an approval before the convention so I can get a booth there, recruit Rotary Clubs to think about organ donation as a project, give them the know-how, tell them that we'll hold your hand. And uh, I want to be able to flag off and be flagged off by all of you on my next drive around North and South America in this truck I'm sitting in right now. So I can meet the other Rotarians all the way down to Argentina. Hopefully all the borders will be open. So immediate RI past president, sir, put in a word in the board, this is pending, <laughs> help me out. I don't have the backing of a lot of people, but the right people I do have. We have a lot of immediate uh, 
PDGs on this uh, RAG, transplant surgeons, recipients and donors, people who know a lot about this and are advocates of this. So I've handpicked these people so we can help humanity through the Rotary spirit. If you had any questions from here, I will take it because I didn't go into the nitty gritties of organ donation as an activity. That could be a whole different talk where I can speak to you as human beings because first that is what you are and humanity is our first religion. But I'm speaking to you today as Rotarians, as a fellow Rotarian. I chartered two clubs, third one on the way. I was a Rotary Youth Exchange student when I was a little boy. My great grandfather was a district governor way back when. So I understand the spirit, stay with me. Your questions, please. Thank you, Anil. What a powerful presentation, truly touching. Um, thank you so much for sharing this and uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, stay blessed. I, I, I want to just uh, mention uh, that Wilfred Wilkinson is the person that Anil is referring to as the past World International President. And I know Wilfred is listening right now, and I hope indeed that he will put a good word in for Anil. Um, with that said, I will uh, introduce to you our President Gerard, who I believe has some questions. Gerard? Yes, I apologize to everyone. I got caught up in some business this morning, and uh, so I was a few minutes uh, late in the presentation. Thank you so much. This was a great presentation. Um, Thank you, sir. I, I have a number of questions for you, and I will cede my place immediately to anyone who goes into the chat room. First question I have to ask you is, what specifically can we as Rotary Club of New York do to help in this issue? Okay. Uh I'm going into how you can help organ donation, not my effort. Organ donation, like I said, has very little that you need to do, but a lot of it. It's giving them the right information, reaching people when they're paying attention to you. Social media doesn't do it. But like I'm trying to reach a million people in your own community in New York, you have a concentration of people. You could go to colleges, you could go to senior homes, you can go to schools and internalize the idea when they're seeding, when they're starting to think, because the more they hear about it, just like any song becomes a hit, it's because you constantly hear it over and over again. Organ donation is a conversation that has to be had over and over again, differently. So you can change policy by going into training EMTs to ask that question, so more people who've signed up, that could be a project. You could uh, uh, gather more people like me who are living organ donors to go speak for everyone that's living and dead and the experiences we have, the first fear is giving a kidney is, hey, I'm going to be uh, uh, living less of a life. And that fear comes in the way of, you know, saving somebody in their own family. Well, put people like us in front and we'll tell you how normal or extraordinary our life has been. I'm an athlete today. I'm a better athlete. I run the 100 meter sprint and I'm 54 now in 13.6 seconds. With one kidney, one is enough. So there could be a lots of campaigning around there. You could be talking to the men and women in uniform. That's one congregation of people you can find, churches, synagogues, temples. Just reach as many people. It takes your time and effort, very little money. Second question I have for you. Um, unfortunately, about 10 years ago, I, I, I was a victim in an accident and I spent about three months in hospital. And this topic came up. And I spoke to a number of people who were patients, mm -hmm. and I got, the, I got a pretty fairly common response. Well, my worry is if I enroll to be a donor, then uh, the doctors, the surgeons won't go that last extra step to keep me alive. How do we okay. respond to that? You respond to that by putting a doctor in place and people who are uh, authorities on the protocol set in place. It is not that easy to declare somebody brain dead. There's a whole process and protocol involved with disconnected doctors who are not connected to the patient or the nephrologist or even the heart transplant surgeon. It is from people outside of that that have no connection. So there is a very strong protocol in place and your medical fraternity, as much as the distrust that we continue to build with them for reasons that they're also responsible for, there is more sanity there than there is insanity. All right, well, that's good to hear then. All right, so we can get uh, Rotary Club of New York uh, if, if we 
uh, request it from the medical profession here in New York. We can get a protocol of how this is done. You got cut off on that. I'm sorry if I was cut off. So we, as, as Rotarians here in New York City, um, and, and I'll mention that we, we also, we have sister clubs who join us from, from Mexico. Turn my video off. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Just... Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we, uh, uh, the Rotary Club in New York, we have sister clubs in, who join us on these videos in, in, in Mexico and Britain and Germany and, and Rome, uh, Cairo, uh, Taipei. Question I have is, we can, can we ask the medical profession to give us this protocol so that we would be able to respond to concerns that people have about this issue? I could research that and send it to you because it's available on Google. Uh, it's, right. it's by far pretty standard everywhere. Right. Uh, and this is a very common question. So yes, I've fielded this many times and uh, that's why I smiled when you were going there. So again, this is all awareness, it's all it takes. There is information, but people are not going to Google this. They'd rather Google than Rihanna's next album, not to chide that in any way. But I don't, I cannot, or nor can you fill tickets, uh, sell tickets to get people come and talk to us, or listen to us about organ donation. I have to go to the people. They're not coming to us. It's a subject that's morbid. Um, so that's the one challenge that all of us are going to have, but we know how to find people. And you know, I heard... May I ask I'm you a sorry. question um, as well? Um, how has the, the, the one uh, kidney donation affected your life personally? Is there extra care you have to take care of yourself in terms of... Not, not at all. That's, that's the whole story. If you, if you realize, or I'll give you another fact, that one in 750 people born in this world are born with one kidney. And uh, they're perfectly normal. So am I, no medication. I, I, everything that I have one off works beautifully now. And I, like I said, I run the marathon, I run the sprint. I, my life is extraordinary now, Andreas. Mm. Better than it used to be because A, I'm taking care of myself better subconsciously. Right, right. That's an important issue, yes. And uh, for those who are wondering, what if I need a kidney when I give one up? Well, there are many laws in this country. Since health is a state issue uh, here, Many states have incentivized kidney donors or liver donors to come up to the top of the waiting list if ever they need one as well. And if New York doesn't have it, I need to find out if it does, then maybe that's a crusade you can fight for people like us to incentivize those that are willing to give it, but take care of them. There's another way you can do this is see if, uh, you know, you could talk to an insurance company. These are life-changing projects. Get to an insurance company and see if we can get, if, you, if somebody, the state, the county, the city, the, the federal authorities can take out a life insurance policy for them that covers funeral costs and things for the family members who consent to give their um, loved one's heart, lung to somebody to save their lives. Small things. These are just, this is not a bribe. It's just saying, thank you. And we're there to support you. Today, a living kidney donor can get $3,000 for lost wages for going, uh, quitting their job or rather get, taking a leave of absence to go and give a kidney to somebody. That's a great start. So mm -hmm. as many things. That's why the RAG, so we can start talking to people about the things that they can do based on their local you know, challenges. Cultural, mostly. Thank you, Anil. We have two questions. First, Tom McConnell and then our Irish return friend, Frank Bannister. Tom, go ahead. Yes, okay. I, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, can Thank you hear you, me, Tom. everybody? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, it was very good. Um, um, you, you just brought up, I was, was going to ask you about the incentives too. I always felt there's, there's an issue there. Why not? Um, if, you're, um, if you donate an organ, um, that maybe your estate will receive five thousand dollars or something, and in, in a country that doesn't afford it, would they have the insurance and all? Uh, would that be? Because there really definitely is a shortage of, of donors, right? Um, and yes. if there was some type of financial incentive that once you pass away, that your estate would receive five thousand dollars. So is that is that considered moral or something? Or um, but do you know the moral issue of that? Well, uh, was marijuana a moral thing a long time ago? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's moral you know, is what you think. But of it's it. changing. If it's going it to save changing. a life, 
Exactly. And I was if you're going to when, save a life. I, I learned something when, when you said that, you know, that, um, um, that some places are offering financial incentives. We had a... America had a gift is. Of life. The 3,000 is yeah, an American you, incentive. Yes. <laughs> are you familiar with um, Gift of Life, Anil? Yes. Yes. So we had a, a my club, my previous club, we had a Chinese um, uh, young boy and his father came, but unfortunately uh -huh. it wasn't successful. And um, he was um, castigated in, back in this Chinese community because they thought that they sold the boy's onion, uh, organs and things. So um, it, was real, it was a real issue with him in China uh, for that. And he didn't, he didn't make, he didn't get the, don he didn't donate the, the, baby, the child's organs, but it was an issue that a lot of people thought that's what he did. So um, well, it's probably an issue all over a, the world. Again, you know, tongues are going to wag and they're going to say things. There's no, you know, we, we cannot avoid that as long as we follow a certain protocol and there is everything that's transparent and Rotary can actually ensure those are projects that one can do is become part of the system because even polio could have been that way, right? But everyone got together to get that done and this can happen yes. uh, in countries that people cannot afford a surgery. In fact, I'll give you a quick anecdote. Yesterday, I, I met a, a handyman that I want to bring, I brought in to get something done in this truck. Uh, Amongst many ones, he said, I'll come. And I'm telling you, God has a hand in this because I believe that, you know, this is a way of telling the dying world that he still exists. He told me his father in Guatemala is on dialysis and that he needs a kidney. I said, why aren't you giving one? He says, well, I'm afraid. And I don't know. He didn't know I was a kidney donor. And I showed him my scar. And I said, I've given one. And why are you afraid? This is how you see me. I'm fit. And, you know, and he says, oh, can I do this then? I said, yes, but it's going to cost me a lot of money. I said, you first go test. Make sure you're viable. I'll find you the money, but let's save this guy. He's your father. Okay. Just, just a final thing. Um, I think you're really on the right track by um, using Rotary. You know, my, I, I would tell people often, uh, what's the purpose of Rotary? Well, uh, Rotary allows ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Yes. And um, and I, I see you you you're, you're staying keeping in track with Rotary, and and that makes you except you that gives you some platform to work with. But you finding that true that the Rotary opens doors for you. I mean, it was oh, just absolutely. you yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 See, what I do in India is I don't talk to, I don't talk to Rotary clubs in India, but I do have a partnership with two districts in India now. Finally, they've, they've finally said okay to me with my uh, foundation, which is called the Gift of Life Adventure Foundation. Yeah. But I, in India, the challenges are different. So what I do is I drive in India and I stop in schools and colleges that are on the highways. Nobody talks to these kids nobody of repute wants to go that far. If it's a big city and if it's a fancy hotel or a convention hall, they'll go. But nobody talks to kids on university in, in, in colleges. And these kids in Indian law, the law gives the right to the next of kin to decide about the organ donation, not the individual. So it's Keep important to work. talk to kids. <laughs> yes, and of course, that's the most important thing. Um, and by the way, I, I, I'm in my car too. And uh, President Gerard thinks I live in my car because I, I join these Zoom meetings when I, I, I could work during the day and still join a Zoom meeting. So uh, I hope you're not living in your truck these days. I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Nice talking to you. Right. You too, Tom. Thanks for your call. Thanks. Uh, Frank, uh, go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I have a couple of the engineer interviews coming out here. I have a couple of practical questions. Uh, the first one is just kind of curiosity. Is there any other mm -hmm. organ that you can give while still alive other than the kidney? Uh, and second question is, are there any kind of age limits? I mean, people like myself now into their 70s, I mean, are our organs, if they're in healthy condition, still good? Or is there a point at which it becomes impractical to take organs from an older person? Or does it depend on the person's health? Okay, so like I said, I was, I was reaching out to you as Rotarians, but now these are human being questions. I'll give you a quick answer on that one. Uh, for afterlife, you can be 130 and still give something that's useful. Secondly, if you don't know what's useful in your body, I think like any faith, you just have to donate it. Let the medical fraternity decide what's useful or not, because they know better. Right? Our job is to be uh, empathetic and give. And let's just say, I want to give, let them figure it out. Now, your eyes, even if they have cataract, if you're retinally blind, you can still give your cornea. Your cornea has three layers each. So six people can see through your eyes, no matter how old you are. Eyes are the only thing you can give, even if you were died of, uh, of cancer. 
Otherwise, they won't take any other part, but eyes they'll still take. Uh, mm -hmm. You could give your skin, you could give your bones, you could give your inner eardrum, you could give your heart ventricles, you could give your intestines, small intestines, your pancreas. You will go back ashes to ashes, dust to dust, but you will reincarnate at the same process. You'll live in another human being. That's fascinating. I, I, I would never have thought that you could get six people out of two eyes. Um, exactly. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Information. Yes. So, Anil, my question to the pancreas, uh, just because I know it's one of the deadliest cancers that people can have, and um, most people do pass away from pancreatic cancer. That is correct, right? Mm -hmm. So, the reason why they don't live is if there are not enough pancreas to be transplanted, or yes. Well, well yes, both. Uh, you can you can give your pancreas only when you're dead, hmm. and if someone doesn't consent to say yes, you know. If, if more people start saying yes, that will start reducing. Same with the bone cancer thing. Wow. Or skin. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, they're all interconnected. <clears throat> Organ donation is just a, a mechanic shop to fix a car <laughs> with True. the spare parts that you were saying yes to. Yeah. We have uh, our Turkish friend, Farouk Kanatar. Would you like to unmute yourself, Farouk? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hey, Thank Farouk. you for letting me in uh, well as i said uh, greetings from uh, um, since i'm here but greetings uh, from adana club turkey district 2430 and thank you very much for the information but the like as uh, the president mentioned the rotarians are ordinary ordinary people doing extraordinary stuff yes we are yes. Uh, since we are the, the rotary club of adana we've been doing lots of you know uh, these projects, the first thing is very common uh, since I'm coming to the, being a donor. So like the blood. So we, is, yes. uh, we are doing lots of the blood donation in Turkey. So which is very, very common. Myself and my wife also, we are the donors for our organs as well. That's another case. That's another thing. So I agree, you know, ash to ash to dust to dust. So at least we can cure some people and we know that like andrea said this pancreas is one of the you know, hard to find and like the liver probably is one of the the most thing to find and my question is probably i'm sorry that well, i get connected a little bit late so probably uh, somebody asked or if not that uh, liver, you can be so, alive you can in your liver with size yeah and the thing is so a lot of people they find this organ in the dark web so they're buying and, you know, this is a big trade. And how do you um, uh, uh, feel this, you know, being like in the dark web and finding like uh, this, the organs? It's, it's, a, it's a very easy solution. Very Anil, you're breaking Easy up. solution. And this is where Rotary and Lions and wiring to the dark web. I'm going to take my video off. Uh, can you hear me better now? Better, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so why are we going to the dark web? It's a very analytical question. We are nothing but living beings that are going to display flight or fight to response to survive. Okay. Uh, more, if morals are going to kill me, I, don't, I cannot afford morals. That's really it. Now, if we are able to get more people to voluntarily donate by giving them the right information and fostering an environment that is going to inspire that, then they won't have to go there. They won't have to. They'll find them in their families, in their communities, in their friend circle. And the Thank laws you. can be geared towards that. Mm -hmm. Anil, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you a question. I, I heard something which was disturbing yesterday here in the mm -hmm. United States. Uh, as a, it's it's being attributed to the to to the COVID uh, pandemic there seems to be a very large increase, uh, a big spike in um, liver cancer in the United States in the past year. Uh, I guess it's because it's being attributed to the increase in uh, alcohol consumption due, due, due to COVID. Have you heard anything about this? And I wanted you to address an issue, namely that yes, you can be alive and you can donate part of your liver uh, and that part that you donate will grow into a functioning liver in another person, if you can discuss that. 
Yes. So first thing, the two things you can donate uh, while you're still alive is the liver and the kidney. The kidney, you have two off. So you could give one away, but the liver, you've got one. And most question is, oh, what do I do? Well, no, they'll take a piece of it and give it to the uh, person that needed. And you, that's enough for that person's liver to, to, to take care of his health. But what about yours? You have now, say, a three-fourth liver. Your liver it, it, it isn't nature wonderful. Your liver is going to grow back to its original size within six weeks. Like you've never given it away at all. It's regenerative. Now, who can donate while they're still alive? Obviously, someone who's fully fit. And in this country, there's an age limit of 65. So if you're above 65, you are not viable to be a living organ donor unless it's at extremely rare, uh, rarest of rare cases where you are 100% fit and then somebody actually needs it, perhaps in your own age group. But yeah, so that's with living uh, donations. And as far as the uh, pandemic, well, it's the cirrhosis of the liver that uh, alcohol causes, not really cancer. Liver cancer is not an alcohol problem, but the cirrhosis and the failure of liver is definitely attributed to alcohol. And uh, yes, larger consumption because it is going to, pregnancies also have gone up because of that. Uh, so, so yeah, those are social, uh, socioeconomic conditions that, that bring it on. Now we've heard, uh, it, it, at least in the West, we've heard a lot about, uh, and I, I can't substantiate this, I don't know whether it's fact or not, um, accusations against the Chinese government, the, the Communist Party government, um, of, yeah. of, of, of prisoners who are being executed so that their organs can be sold on the black market. Uh, is this affecting people's attitude towards organ donation? Does it have a negative effect? No, I don't believe so, because as I have driven through China. I've driven through Turkey. I wish I had known and I could have, I would love to come back and do those talks over there. Uh, see, that way, if you look at Japan, Japan does not believe in it. It's not part of their culture or their medical really? practice. Wow. And I'm still trying to figure out why. But at some point in China, because they can, they do it. That's hmm. why the legal system over there. So that's when I say three strong pillars, you need all three of them. The legal pillar so nobody gets hurt. The medical pillar so everyone gets well. And the social pillar that everyone's loving each other. So in China, the, the legal pillar is a little shaky, <laughs> to say the least. But Shintoism but, does not allow Japanese uh, adherents to donate? I don't believe any ism allow, uh, dissuades it, any. If somebody actually proved and showed me the scriptures that said it, I would rethink my entire purpose of my life. Mm -hmm. But in seven years, I haven't heard any religion that says no. It's the interpretation of it. So how do you counter fake news? That's exactly that. We have a responsibility to do it. And we're everywhere, including Japan. All right. So I know we look forward to any information you get to us. You said, you know, you would send us something and uh, I can tell you, I will bring this up with the board and we will help spread the word here with the Rotary Club of New York. Oh, that's music to my ears. And uh, I'm going to be shameless enough and say, please support me so I can keep going in mm -hmm. whatever way you can. Uh, and most of all, uh, RIP passed. <laughs> get my RAG approved, please. This will bring 50 more people committed to this cause involved in this. And, and Neil, we do have some more questions. Uh, if you're yeah, no, I'm here. To... I'm I'm yeah. here as long as you are. <laughs> Actually, um, we have a question from our member Fredley Kaplan, who works for Gift of Life, and her question is: Are children who unfortunately die of heart disease able to donate other organs such as eyes or livers or lungs? Yes. Short answer. Yes. Uh, Fredley, and did you want to ask answer, another question, a follow-up question? And, or? The, and the long answer is we need to let people know that they shouldn't decide what's good in their body or not. Okay. We need to let them know that you give your body so that you are going to help somebody with the hope. Because when you put money into the church's giving box, you don't really know where it goes, right? You have the faith that it'll go to a good place. That's the medical community. They'll make sure it goes to a good place. Um, thank you. Um, Gift of Life, of course, operates on children all over the world. So the, the country from which the children come from would make a difference. Um, 
And also when a parent loses a child, I think it's very difficult to say, then would you donate um, the organs? But I, so we have never dealt with this in our organization to my knowledge, um, but it might be an option in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank you for your answer. I, I could throw a little bit of uh, auto-suggestive uh, direction yeah. in your thinking there. Yeah. Now, organ donation is run by the law of the land and not where the person comes from. So if they're here in America, American laws will apply, except here you'll need the consent of the parent. The right. parent doesn't have to go and get a no objection from their government over there. Oh, okay. I see. Like a lot of people in India, when they come as tourists and they die, unfortunately, and they are organ donors, uh, mm -hmm. The family consents wherever they are, and it happens in India because they need family consent. I so see. So here the law of America applies, so you don't have to worry about those countries. Oh, that's amazing. And, okay. Right? And, uh, you know, I'm dealing with a very horrible situation as we speak. Uh, last month while I was driving around, I stopped in Little Rock to meet my classmate from grade 7, 8, 9, and 10, <laughs> who I haven't seen in 38 years, and he's on dialysis. <laughs> So I wanted to go and give him some hope and uh, see how we can get the family involved. A month later, yesterday, I got to hear that his daughter, who I'd met for two hours, who won my heart, got involved in a really terrible accident in India on a wedding that she had gone to visit. And she's in coma and almost brain dead. And the conversation that I had to now have with that friend of mine is to beg him to let her live in somebody. Don't let her just die. If you can't, if we can't save her medically and bring her back home safe. And I, hear, I hear you. <laughs> that is, um, thank you very much. That's so touching. And it is true that the child would live in somebody else. Um, many, oh my God. Many people. Yeah, that's a wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fredley. Um, can we take another question from Frank uh, Bannister? Go ahead. Sure, uh, I'm just curious. A, a few days ago, I re recall reading somewhere that surgeons had successfully transplanted a, kid, a pig's kidney into pig. the yeah. uh, what, what, what are your views on that? Do you think that's it? Oh, I, think, I think it's, uh, well, one swallow doesn't make a summer, but it's certainly waiting for most swallows to show up because if that happens, that's going to solve a large problem. I put one economic issue in front of you to address this. Okay, or what is the impending doom when it comes to this? A lot of uh, uh, arguments within the activist community where I'm part of the organ donation is uh, more people are trying to get more consent from uh, cadaveric families and trying to say that living organ donation should not be the first option. Okay, first of all, there's not too many people dying of brain death to meet the demand, number one. Number two, uh, a lot of them are dying whoever is dying of uh, brain death is a traffic accident victim with head injuries. Now, with the impending economic boom, boom that we are seeing in front of us, and this is pure economics, of the transportation as a service, where all the EV vehicles are coming in and uh, autonomous vehicles are coming in, making it safer and less accidents will happen. I mean, it's kind of weird to think that more, less accidents, oh, there's less people going to die, which also means you're going to have less organs. <laughs> yes. Addressing that is equally important today, and living organ donation is one, and the pig, well, we eat chicken, so uh, I know the uh, animal rights people are not going to be happy, but somewhere, somehow, it might be a problem for Muslims with it because pigs are a clean animal. Well, let me tell you about the Muslim problem. Okay. Uh, the two biggest, um, I'd say, I'm looking for the right word, the two biggest security guards for the religion of Islam are Saudi Arabia and Iran, the Shia, the Shia Sunni divide. Now, traditionally, if you go out, We've lost but today, him. are you are we here? Uh, could you go back? You just said traditionally, and I lost you at that. Traditional, point. traditionally, the Muslims don't. They say that their religion doesn't allow organ donation. There's a fatwa against it. But the Saudis and the Iranians 
they send at least 50 people, 50 athletes to the World Transplant Games. It's illegal there now. When yeah. someone has to live, you'll find a way to make it live. Rules are there to be bent. And if the pig is the only one that will make you live, you'll find a way to make it work. Yeah. Andreas, did uh, uh, Dr. Nora have a question? George? It will take time. That's what I'm saying. We, because... Yeah, so uh, thank you, Andrea. My question is really, really has to do with illegal organ trafficking. Uh, this has been a concern, I raised a few concerns in Northern Africa. And as if I may recall, in 2013, in Britain, a Somalian uh, citizen was a lady, uh, was uh, trans. Uh, transported to UK for the purpose of uh, harvesting her organ and that really caused a lot of uproar in the British press. So would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, I'll go back to the same dark web. If we're able to get more people to understand what it means for their own families, for their own lives maybe, then all of this will start reducing. I mean, I'm sorry to make an analogy, but it's not meaning with, it's not meant with disrespect, but there are so many cars being stolen every day, but they're still selling new cars. People are still buying them. It's a small percentage. The bigger problem I see that cannot be solved, this I think can be solved with a lot more awareness if the entire global community comes together with this, making people understand the role they play in saving lives. But the illegal trafficking, trafficking of ch children and women, I don't see an end to that. I wish we can, but this is really not the problem. I, I think, and my next drive will be in Africa and I would love to you know, address through Rotary there, giving me a platform to address this and let people understand what it really means because I don't think they know. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Farouk, would you like to pose your other question you had? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my First is my contribution to Anil, and I am Muslim, and I'm from Turkey, and almost like 98% is, you know, Muslim in in I, Turkey. And I was there. In, yeah, in Quran, yeah, you said you were there, and in Quran, it's not written, you know, you know yes, that you not cannot. Written. Yeah, it is not written, and so that's the you know probably. The, some countries they practice in a different ways, like uh, the Shiites or the Sunnis. I'm Sunni, and so we in, in Turkey, and being a donor, and it is uh, done by like uh, it's, it's legal, you know, you can, and it's done by the government, you know, you can go and yes. donate through the, 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 the health department or whatever in the city or the, in, in other in, in places. So that's, that's my contribution the second is like a question um, what if if a person is a donor and dies in COVID-19 and still it's usable or you know no, they don't the, they don't they, unfortunately okay. they don't they don't okay and you said that a lot of people you know they die you know, the, the traffic crashes and everything it's lots of people and you know thousands of people in somewhere in the world and and you were right, that could be used for the, for the people who are waiting there on the line. Well, that is used, that is used everything. currently. That is happening currently. But if you reduce the accidents by putting in safer cars, uh, which is great, it's saving lives, but it's not, it's, yes. uh, what do you do with those waiting for an organ now? So it is important to have alternative, uh, there are lots of uh, artificial kidneys being tested, robotic kidneys, robotic eyes, you know, Star Trek may come alive. But yeah, it's important to continue that uh, quest in science. Thank you. Thank, if thank you, you very much. Drive it, and next time into Turkey, Adana, we are, you're welcome to be in our club. Oh, you can count on it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, John German, uh, John, would you like to pose your question or comment, I believe you had? Yes, uh, just an observation about pig donations. 
And that is, you know, when I was living and working in Brazil in the 1970s, in 1974, there was the first ever uh, you know, major high-rise fire, you know, the Curfew Sul fire, uh, which is a bank that, uh, that we owned uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, it became uh, you know, best known for uh, the helicopter rescues, which were the first time that was ever done uh, from a high-rise fire. And it was also the first really big high-rise fire ever. You know, and you know, I knew personally people who had worked with me who you know, were badly burned in that fire. Oh, no. and, they, you know, you know, and they received, you know, again, medical pioneering. You know, they, they, they received uh, transplants of pig skin. You know, and, you know, and they had major pieces of their of their their skin you know, that were done with you know, with uh, uh, as I put it in chateau de porco which was you know a transplant of pig skin to human skin and they were the living exemplars of the value of that so I couldn't encourage you more to do this and I look forward to seeing how we in the Rotary Club of New York you know, can get from you uh, a list of the various legal, regulatory, and business opportunities you know, so we can go advocate with you know, the various uh, stakeholders uh, who control the rules you know, for those things uh, to do some of the things that you've mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And um, that's why skin donation is also important. So you don't have to get, take it from pigs. Human skin can be done if they get it. They don't get it. That's the problem. Anil, uh, Wilfred, our past Rotary International president, has oh. raised his hand. I think he's going to approve your action group right now. So go ahead. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Uh, all right. Thank you. Very, very interesting program, Anil. I congratulate you. Uh, the, the, uh, there was one mention, I thought, that somebody said, uh, at least in, I don't know, whether in North America, that there was an age limit for receiving these things of 65. And no, I, I didn't, I hadn't heard that. In no, it's for giving. It's not for receiving. Oh, it's for giving. giving. I see. Oh, this yes. is for donating. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm approaching organ donation from a donation point of view, because if you inspire donors, then there's organ donation. Yeah. So the well, idea is to inspire donors. Where, where in India are you now staying? Residing, I, I I live. I'm right now in New Jersey, but I live yeah. in Bangalore. I'm heading to Bangalore on the 9th of Bangalore, November, yeah. uh, and I'll be back in April to to get ready for my drive to Houston. That's a nice nice place, Bangalore. Yeah, I've been there. It is. I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wilfred. Uh, before we pass the word to our president, Gerard, for final remarks, Agim had one last question. Agim, Sheho? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, you're muted, Agim. Okay, I, I will post the question for him then. Um, uh, I repeat again. Okay, go ahead. Ken? Yes, we can uh, hear you. I thank uh, Mr. Anil for this very positive information uh, regarding this special issue. But I have a question, a good discussion between different peoples here. And uh -huh. uh, I, I can say, are there any requests for legalization of this road of yours? And uh, what progress has been made up to now? So I I'm trying to understand the question, legalization of what? Or this uh, job which you have done up to now. Legalization. Oh, that's not illegal. So I don't see any need for legalization. More people do what I do. I think it will get there quicker. That's the whole point. Um, that's why I'm get, getting to Rotary and starting here because this is a family that I know. So yeah, there's nothing illegal about what I'm doing. Uh, I speak from a perspective of a kidney donor and I have uh, as much authority to do that as a doctor does because I'm the one that went through it. I'm living that life. And that's more inspiring for people to hear from me 
because a doctor will give you the medical mumbo jumbo, which is great, but that only comes when somebody says, okay, I'm willing to do it. And that willingness comes from someone who wants to hear if I'll be okay, because it's at the end of the day, they love themselves more. And uh, if they know they're going to be okay, they'll say yes. And now let now tell me what I need to do. And that's when the doctor comes in. Okay, here's what happens. So it's, it's everybody's job to get involved because we are all life givers. Thank you, Anil. Um, President Gerard. Thank you, Andreas. And Anil, thank you very much for um, making this presentation to us today. Um, it reminds us of um, the urgency of dealing with these kinds of, of, of uh, situations that you had mentioned. Sometimes people tend to think of it as, as a bit morbid, but in fact, it is a gift. It's a gift of life. And it's something that I think everyone should consider, certainly. I and my family have thought of that. Thank you again for being with us. And we look forward to continuing the relationship. And as soon as you send us information, I can promise you we will act on it. Um, I certainly will. And here's my, here's what I live in, uh, what I do. <laughs> be an organ donor, I see it. Rotary, I love it. Thank you. That, that logo is gonna go bigger. I th that, that sounds great to me. <laughs> Thank you again well, thank for you, being President. with us. Thank you all of you and Andreas for coordinating this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I thank everybody for participating. I also want to invite you to next week's luncheon, uh, which is at the same time, uh, same place, uh, again, uh, virtually. And we're going to have Ulrich Gaillard, the head and founder of Bate Relief Alliance, is going to talk to us about the situation in Haiti. So I, I hope you can tune in for that. And Andreas mentioned to everyone involved, uh, you will be getting some information in the mail quickly, hopefully. Uh, we're, we're working on it, a, uh, a directory. Uh, and we are planning for an in-person event uh, in the not too distant future. So hopefully we can try to get back to, well, as normal as we can be considering the situation. Thank you again, everyone, for being with us today. Please be safe. We look forward to seeing from you next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.